Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that you uh, all come to listen to me. Uh, and um, I have made three lectures, and here they are on the, in this email that I sent to the organization. The first lecture is on... Uh, is on uh, so they, these lectures are taken from my course on machine learning. And uh, the first one... So um, it, I had to make a guess about what your get background and interest uh, was, and I made these three uh, lectures. The first one is, uh, is about uh, the perceptron and about uh, optimize, uh, learning. Uh, as in machine learning uh, for as an optimization problem and how you can do that and various methods uh, for that. And then um, I will connect it also. So this is very basic. So what I, what I decided to do is actually to teach very basic stuff, very uh, fun, uh, rudimentary stuff, so not uh, the latest uh, in the research, but I wanted to also connect to the research. So the way that that is these three lectures, the first one is on, this, on these learning rules, and then uh, I go into, uh, I will, at the end I will get, tell something about the binary perceptron, which is a perceptron with binary synapses and how you can optimize that. And that's a very recent work that I uh, have, have been doing. So that's the first lecture. Second one is, uh, is, uh, is on, uh, on stochastic processes and on ergodicity, on Markov processes and, uh, and how from that you can get to, uh, to uh, equilibrium distributions uh, to uh, uh, Gibbs distributions, uh, about detailed balance, uh, about uh, what it means ergodic, uh, uh, ergodic, uh, ergodicity uh, theory, uh, phase transitions, and those kind of things. Also very uh, basic, uh, very rudimentary in a sense. Very, um, and then it, it uh, connects to my most recent work, which is on, on quantum machine learning, uh, which I give a talk out about on, on Thursday afternoon, but I just heard from the organizers that that's not a, a no-go for you guys because you have a class here. So I'm sorry about, uh, that you have to miss, uh, miss on that part on this connection. But anyway, so that's quantum machine learning. That's a little bit maybe not in your direct focus uh, uh, anyway. And then the third lecture is on, um, uh, on, uh, on control theory. And in particular, uh, I have uh, been developing the so-called path control theory over the last uh, 10 years. And I will try to give in one and a half hours, give you, uh, give you the gist of that theory, what that is, and some applications uh, of, that, of that work. So um, I would like to a little bit understand who is, uh, who is sitting here in front of me. So who have a background in physics, a degree in physics? Ooh, that's, that's uh, more than half of the class. OK. Who have a degree in computer science? That's the other half of the universe. OK, that's computer science. Okay, and so who has neither a degree in physics nor computer science? Uh, that's so, and that should be neuroscience, maybe. So let me see. So, 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 could, can can you scream to me what what your degree is if it's not physics or computer science? Electrical engineering. Uh huh. Mathematics. Mathematics. Neuroscience. Neuroscience. Okay, so, okay, so who of you have taken a course on machine learning? That's. Slightly less than half, right? Uh, okay, so that should be okay. That gives me a little bit of idea. Okay, let's get started. So you have this. Maybe you have this information probably. So here is this. Uh, here is this web page of my course. And so we're going to be doing this. Uh, this first uh, lecture here: supervised learning perceptrons and, and gradient descent. There's also. I also suggested some exercises. I'm, I'm sure you got that material also. These exercises are uh, for you to program uh, and to do, and they are quite, um, well, they're, they're involved. Like, like always, if you want to program something from scratch, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing, but uh, it, uh, there is a, there's a little bit of a, of a template here that uh, should get you started with the data, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay, let's, let's go. Uh, let's get it up. So, okay, so we're going to be talking about the perceptron. So who knows what a perceptron is? So, uh, less than half. So perceptron is maybe is the first neural network. Uh, it's a neural network consisting of one neuron. So it's one neuron, one little ball, and it has a bunch of inputs, and that's the whole neural network. And it can do uh, perception because the input can be very large, and then it just has to, you know, this, this, this little unit has to decide something. If it fires, 
there is, a, there is a cat in the picture. If it doesn't fire, there's no cat in the picture. So that is the neural network, what it does. Now, this very simple neural network was uh, cooked up by, uh, by Frank Ro Rosenblatt in 1962. He was uh, uh, very excited about this, and he said, well, this, now we have a machine that can learn, uh, and it can uh, be intelligent, and it can reproduce itself, and all this kind of thing. He made a very, very wild statement about this very, very simple neural network consisting of one, of one neuron. Now, of course, there was a lot of industrial interest there, and everybody, uh, the sky was the limit, and, and people got very excited about that. They got a lot of patents uh, in the 60s, uh, and uh, it was a big hype. Uh, and then somebody found out that uh, actually these perceptrons can only do very little things. Uh, they can only learn a certain class of problems, and we'll come to that, what they can learn. And then we got into the uh, neural network winter, in a sense, then uh, other interests uh, came up. Uh, when neural networks get out of fashion, it's not so much that they're suddenly bad, but there's so, some, suddenly something else that's more interesting. So that's, that's what, what's happening. So it's happened at that time, and were the expert systems. The expert systems got very popular, particular to do a medical diagnosis, etc. So there was this yin yang between. Uh, uh, actually, maybe there's also an interesting story to tell. So after the Second World War, uh, computers were invented in a sense because the transistor was invented, and uh, the, the idea was from the very start: from, have, shall we make our computer a digital machine or an analog machine? And there were, there were pros, pros for both of these camps, and the digital. Once they work with, with, with bits, right? And the analog one, they work with analog currents. And uh, there was something to be said for both. And the people who were thinking about the early computers were also the same people who were very much interested in AI and in machine learning. So names like, like John von Neumann, who was you know, the, the grandfather of our current uh, modern computer, people like, like, von, uh, like uh, Turing, these people were not only interested in the conventional computer, but very much interested also in the brain. And, and so these, these questions, they, they, they were very much, uh, uh, very much in the air. And these two streams, this analog stream and the digital stream, they, 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 they existed actually up to, I would say, up to the mid-90s. And the analog stream had, a, had, their, had their analog stream in AI. And it was one of the analog things was the neural networks. The perceptron was an analog thing. Uh, control theory was an analog thing. On the digital side, you had uh, the, the, the theorem provers, the, uh, the, the, the chess computers, those kind of uh, things, the digital, uh, digital world. So I'm going to put things in bits and you know, make explicit knowledge. Or we're doing, so people were talking also about symbolic and sub-symbolic, because it's very old-fashioned terms, which I, I think are now slightly uh, ridiculous. But anyway, so there were, they, they, these terms were used. And so uh, this analog stream, then, so, so when, the, when the expert systems took over in the 70s, so there was this, this, this going back and forth. And then in the 80s, the neural networks came back up again. And uh, they were, were a big hype. Same happened. Multi-layer perceptrons we got. New patterns. A lot of hype. Everybody uh, thought it was uh, solved everything. And then the winter started again. And this winter was the, was the Bayesian machine learning, the Bayesian story. So the Bayesian stuff got into a conference called uh, NIPS, which was, was very, very dominant, has been very dominant in this whole history. And, and uh, the probabilistic approach to, uh, to doing knowledge representation and doing learning became very, very dominant. And then you could suddenly see that a neural network could be written as a probabilistic inference problem, that you have some probability distribution between input and output, and you just, you know, it's a probabilistic description of a neural network. And same goes with your expert system. You could write your expert system as a graphical model, which is a, which is a graph, and where the logical statements, A implies B, etc., become probabilistic space statements, A implies B with a certain percentage. And so suddenly everything became one happy family. And the, the, the difference, in my view, between the sub-symbolic analog uh, stream and the symbolic digital stream sort of uh, fade, uh, faded away into this Bayesian uh, Moloch, this Bayesian machine learning that we now, uh, all, that's now so, so, so strong, uh, strong, strong there. So that was there for since the uh, mid 90s, and then, uh, then in 2005, 2006, that whole thing got, uh, got canned again because then the deep learning uh, started to, to kick in, and, and then, uh, well, the rest is history, and you know all about that. So I'm going to tell you about this first, uh, first neural network, um, this perceptron. So here's the perceptron, and so you take an image of an A or a cat, uh, and you do some uh, low-level feature uh, extraction, and then you get a bunch of numbers, and on this, these numbers you're going to add them 
uh, with weights, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, weights here, so you see this weights W, so you take it through some nonlinearity, you get some Ws, and then this output is a, is a single number, this is an inner product, and that single number you take the sign of it, if it is positive, excuse me, you say it's class one, and if it's negative, it's class two, and so that is the whole of the, whole of the perceptron. And so uh, we're going to ignore this, this, these features. Uh, so these features phi, um, for, the, for the perceptron treatment, we can ignore them. We just say, say that they're absent. So instead of having uh, these features, we're going to be saying that we have uh, just the, uh, the input x as a vector, and we're going to have a vector w, and we're going to take the inner product, and we're going to take the sign of that, and that is our whole, uh, whole perceptron. And so the, uh, the, the, the task of the perceptron is, is here that I have a bunch of, uh, a bunch of patterns, say uh, uh, x uh, labeled by mu, and I have target outputs t uh, also labeled by mu, and I have a whole bunch of those. So a bunch of pictures of cats, a bunch of pictures of uh, non-cats, and I want to uh, build a classifier, and that means in this case that I want a, this, this weight factor w to be such that whenever I put thing, this, this pattern mu in there, that I get the correct label t mu. So this should hold for all mu. And I want to find one set of weights that, that, that uh, does that, right? So this is the learning problem. Now this learning problem, we can think of this as, a, as this inner product. So there is uh, this w dot x. So we have that if w dot, uh, so I forget about these arrow signs because uh, they're always there. So this w dot x, if this is positive, we have uh, class 1, and if w dot x is negative, we have class minus 1, right? So this is the two classes we have. So in other words, if we look at the line w dot x is equal to 0, we have the separator. This is separating the two classes. So the mental picture is, is that we have, a, have an input space, and we have a line, and this line is separating the cats from the non-cats, right? And the line's a straight line because it's given by this linear uh, expression. Right, okay, so, uh, so here you see an example of that. So you, here you see a bunch of black points and you see a bunch of white points and you see a line in between that's separating the blacks from the whites. And so this is a good learned uh, situation. And the learning problem is, of course, to orient this line in the right, in the right way. Now, uh, we can do a little trick and say, okay, let's multiply this equation on both sides with, uh, with t mu. So then we get t mu here, and since t mu is plus or minus 1, its square is equal to 1. So we get here 1. And so this is a sign, this is a, this is a plus or minus 1, and so we can take this inside the thing and multiply it here, t mu here, get rid of it here. And then we see that what we need, that if we transform our input data, that we go our input data goes from x mu, comma, t mu, to a representation which is x mu times t mu, then we need that in this transformed space, where this is, you know, these are, this is a vector with components, right? So this is we call z i mu, that these transformed vectors, which are unchanged for the, for the data of class 1, but have got a minus sign for the label for the data of class minus 1, they are uh, also vectors. And if we do that, we see that what we, what we are left with here is that basically the sign of this thing has to be positive. So we need that uh, w transpose times z mu is larger than zero for all, for all mu, right? So this is what we need. So we have to find such a w. So we have a bunch of z's, that's our data, and we want to find a w that has a positive inner product with all the z's. So that's, uh, that's it. So uh, now this, as I said, this, this, this perceptron draws a line, and some, uh, some problems are, uh, are of that type and some are not, right? A simple example that you can give you, if I give you a, uh, 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 an ant problem, so I have two inputs, x1, x2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and if the output is the ant, so then it's uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. If I make a picture of that, I get here 0, 0, I get 0, 1, I get 1, 0, and here I get the other class. And it's clear that I can separate this with the ant very easy. So this is a linear separable problem. There's a line that separates the two classes. If I would have the exclusive OR problem, so I have X OR, that means that the truth table is 0, 1, 1, 0. That means that I would get here, in this picture, I would get 0, I would get 1, 1, 0. And now you see you cannot draw one line that separates the, the crosses from the, the, from the circle. So you need at least two lines. 
So uh, these are examples of well and not linearly separable uh, uh, problems. And so the perceptron can only solve linearly separable problems. So the, um, the perceptron learning rule is, uh, is a very, uh, very simple learning rule that just cycles through all the examples that you have. And then one example, uh, if you, you start with the current weight vector, W, and if, the, if you, you, you present your example, you look at the inner product, Z, or whether it's positive with that example. If it is, you don't, don't adapt uh, W. And if it's not uh, positive, you adapt it in a way, right? And this is the simple rule. So you, and that's given here on this, on this, on this slide here. So we go, uh, we, we, the new one is the old one plus a change. And the change has this theta function, which, is, which has uh, as output 0, 1, depending on whether the argument is positive. If the argument is positive, it will output a 1. If the output, if the input, if the argument is negative, it will, it will output a zero. So if ZW is positive, it will output a zero and the delta W is zero. And if the ZW is, uh, is negative, it will output a one and the learning will happen, right? And the learning will be just uh, Z mu itself, uh, eta times, times Z mu, where Z mu was this product of uh, input and output. Okay, so that's the learning rule. And this learning rule, uh, you can, we can illustrate very uh, nicely here in this example. So, well, first let me note that this eta is, is a learning rate, that is the amount that you adapt uh, the, 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 the step size, is to say, in this learning step. But for this algorithm, actually this eta is completely irrelevant, and we might as well take it equal to, to 1. So as we will see later with gradient descent rules, then the learning step is really important. If it is too large, you get no convergence. If it's too small, you get convergence, but you get a very slow algorithm, so there is a whole story there. But here, in this case, actually this eta doesn't play any role of significance. The reason is that it just multiplies. So if you start with weight zero, then you see that the, that the size of your weights will be proportional to eta, and the size of the weights is not important for the problem because the size of the weights is here in the sine function, and whether you have a weight vector of, si of size uh, 1,000 or a weight vector of size 1, it doesn't affect the sine, so it doesn't affect the performance. So the whole size of the weight vector is, is, is irrelevant. So we might as well say this, put this eta equal to 1, and then to, is illustrated the result in this, in this figure here. So suppose that our initial weight vector is this weight vector w here, this uh, here over there. We have a two-dimensional problem, so we have a two-dimensional weight vector. And we have a bunch of training samples which are given here, x1, x2, x3. And these x's are in fact the z's that I have. That's, a, that's because in this picture I could not change the x to the z. So this one is, should be noted as this x's are z's. So if I take eta is equal to 1, so what I have to do? I have this, this initial weight vector. I, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. By the way, you can also ask more difficult questions than, uh, than, <laughs> than, than that one. <laughs> yeah, because I have a tendency to, uh, to blast on, so please, a good way to, uh, to have an interaction, to, have a, to slow me down, is to ask questions. So, so we start with the first weight vector, and, we're, and uh, that's this, and we have this first pattern x1, and we take the inner product, we have to look at the inner product, and if we take this inner product, you see it's slightly larger than 90 degrees, so the inner product is negative. So therefore, the learning rule fires. And so we have to have the delta, which is just uh, the z, right, and which is just x. And we have to add the, to the old vector, we have to add the x, we get the new vector, right? That's what, uh, that's what the learning rule does. So we get this new vector here. So now we go to our second training example, which is this x2 here, right? And we see that its inner product is negative. So we have to add it, we get here. Then we go to x3, it gets a little boring. So we have to add it, we have to look at the inner product, it's negative, so we have to change weights. So the weights become here. Then with this one, then we have, we're done with our data set, we go back to the first pattern, which is this one, it has a positive inner product, we don't have to do anything. We look at the second one, we get a positive inner product. We look at the third one, we have a positive inner product, learning is terminated. So the funny thing about this learning rule is that it converges in a finite number of uh, iterations, right? This is, as you may know from some gradient descent rules, that is, you get asymptotic convergence after infinitely long time, where infinity is replaced by your patience, that you say, okay, now it's good enough, I'm going to stop. But uh, in principle, you get asymptotic convergence. Here you get finite time convergence, finite number of iterations. 
Okay, so, uh, but does this always work? Uh, and therefore, we, this is not the case, of course. Uh, and um, so, in order to get there, we have to build a bit of, uh, of, of intuition here. So, so we can, so we have to have a W which has a positive inner product with all the Z's, right? And so, if we look at the, at the worst one, the minimum of this inner product, then if we make that as large as possible, we're doing good, right? Because then we, we push up everybody. So if the smallest is large enough, then as li as if the smallest is positive, then they're all positive and we have a learned solution. So one criterion would be to say, okay, let's define this quantity and as a function of W and I'll find a W that, uh, find a w that maximizes D, right? That's, uh, that would be a criterion to, to try to satisfy. And there is a 1 over W here because to just emphasize that this whole quantity, this quality of the perceptron doesn't depend on the size of the, or the norm of the weight, so we can just take that out. Right, so now if, if, the large, if the solution is positive, here you see two cases where the solution is positive. Here, uh, in this left uh, case, the, the solution is, uh, there, the solution, all these vectors W, have all a positive inner product with all these data points, right? Because this one is just like doing this line, so it's just slightly, st still slightly non-negative here. And if you could turn this all the way there, it's still, uh, this one is just touching, this is negative. So all these are good solution. And there is the best one, which is here in the middle, which has a quite a good positive inner product with, with all of them. So you have a large positive D in this case if, for this best solution. In this case, you see it's actually the, the, pro, the, 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 the number of solutions is much less because if I, if I go out of this cone, I will always violate one. And so you see here the, the best, best solution uh, is like this and it, it has a very low uh, uh, D because the worst, pattern, the worst pattern is still very close to uh, giving inner product zero, right? So you have easy problems where D is larger than zero significantly, then you have marginal problems where D gets close to zero, you can just barely learn them. And then there's, of course, problems where the best solution has a D that is negative, right? You can also have problems which are not linearly separable. For instance, this exclusive or problem. Then your best D is, is negative. Okay, so this, this is this, uh, uh, the idea. So, um, Question. Uh, yeah. So by linear problem here, you mean linear in the input vector or linear in weight vector? I mean linearly separable. Yeah. 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 And yeah. It's yes. Yes. But not in the original space. Yes. So if you, you kind of can transform it, so the whole, yeah. So, um, what's your question? My question: When, when you mean by linear, prop, uh, linear model, it's linear in the input vector. Or linear well, in this case, it's both, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did I say? What was? So I mean, the uh, first you you have this p of x time uh, the product. Yeah. Then, then, we, then they remove the, the basis function. Yeah. And then you yeah. Just stuck with yeah. The x. Input. X. Yeah. So what is supposed to be the correct uh, way? Of so whether you put these phi's in there or not, I mean, so the picture is right. You have some in, input x. You transform it to a phi of x. And you do then a linear combination. So you have essentially, let's, let's put it like this. So you have here your input different x uh, components, right? So you make your, your, your features. And so in principle, the, this first feature depends on all the x and all the features depend on all the x, right? So you get this, this transformation, which may be a nonlinear transformation, something like that. And then you take a linear combination of these things, and that gives you then, then you sum that, and then you take a, take a threshold. Uh, threshold of that, right? So this is the, this is the picture. And um, so I'm just saying, well, let's suppose that we have done this pre-processing and call phi, whatever that is, that we call our axis, right? So that's, but you probably understand that, and I still don't understand your question. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I, the, your definition of a linear model just is, is linear in the wave vector or linear in the input vector? Or, uh, I mean, it's, uh, well, what I meant, what I, I, I maybe I, I'm not sure what I meant. Um, uh, what I, what I'm talking about in this con context, what is really important for the perceptron learning rule, is the fact of linear separable. So that means that whether the data are such that there is a solution which has 
this property that it's true for all uh, for all patterns. So that is that is it's about it's a it's a feature of the problem, not so much of the whether it's linear in X or linear in W. It's also, but yeah. Okay. So. Um, I mean, every problem is linearly separable. In some way, after you do sufficient basis transformation, you can always, uh, you can always. So that's, so this is not, uh, so of course, you can, in a multilayer perceptron, in fact, what happens is that you do a whole bunch of nonlinear transformations, such that at the end of the day, you get a representation such that things are easily linearly separable, right? That's one way of looking at a multilayer perceptron. We're here just looking at this. It's not linear in the way. I mean, the multilayer perceptron is not linear in the way. No, it's not. It's non-linear the weights, and it's non-linear the inputs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. So this, this is different. So, so the XOR can be still linear in the weights and can be still uh, linearly separable in another space. If you transform it, yeah. But if often this transformation is very hard. So it's a, if you do it as a learning problem, this is a hard issue. Yeah. Okay. So. This, this, this perceptron learning rule, the question is, does this converge? And um, what you, one can show that the perceptron learning rule converges provided that the, that the problem is linearly separable. So, that's to say, if I like this example that I gave with the three, three samples, I do a, I ha, this is a linear separable problem because there exists a W which has a positive inner product with all the three, and if I do this learning rule, I will find this in a finite number of iterations. If the data are such that no such solution exists, for instance, if the data in the Z space would be like, uh, uh, you know, would be pointing in all directions, right? In all directions, the data, the Z vectors, then I can, of course, not find a W which has a positive inner product with all of them, right? And, uh, and then this, this perceptron learning rule uh, doesn't converge. And the proof is, um, is, quite, um, is quite easy. Uh, and it's quite, quite, uh, quite curious, I would say. Uh, so the, the proof goes as following. So suppose that there is a solution, this W star, it exists, and it has a D, which is positive, right? That's, and the problem, so the problem is linearly separable. So now, um, so in each iteration, we, we update only if the, the, in, that, in that iteration the inner product is negative, right? And we denote by M mu a counter the number of times that pattern mu has been used to update the W. Right? So we start with W, say, zero, and then it evolves in a number of steps, and the resulting W that we get is the number of times that we present a pattern mu times that pattern mu itself, uh, times the learning rate, if you want. Right? So this, is, uh, this is then the total weight that you get after a bunch of uh, updates. Right? So we have like three times pattern one, and two times pattern two, and we have to add all these things, because that was what we did, if I remind you, in the learning rule. This is what we did here, uh, where was it? Here. In this learning rule, we, we add this thing, we add these vectors, and the number of times we add the vector one is m1, the add times the vector two is m2, etc. So we get this, uh, um, this total vector. And now consider this quantity. We take our current solution, w, and we inner product it with the, uh, with the W star solution that we are supposed to, that is given, and we take the divided by the norm. So this, this quantity is, in fact, is the, is, the, is the cosine of the angle between these two n-dimensional vectors, right? Now, this cosine is between plus and minus one, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a no-brainer that we know for sure. Now, I will show that, uh, that this ratio will grow as order, uh, order square root of n. That is to say that if m keeps on... Uh, uh, keeps, on, uh, keeps on growing, then this, this right-hand side will get arbitrary large, and it will get over this value 1. So the, the, the proof is out of uh, contradiction, so let us, let us assume that the perceptron learning rule does not converge, right? Then M will grow, that by definition, indefinitely, right? That's the meaning of non-converging. I will have to keep on updating. And therefore, this will grow, and therefore I will violate this bound, and therefore I get a contradiction, and therefore my assumption that the learning rule doesn't converge is wrong, the learning rule converges, right? So this is the proof. 
Okay, so we have to show this, that this grows, and it's very easy because we have a numerator which we're going to show is greater than, larger than something and a denominator we're going to show that's smaller than something. The numerator, we take this inner product, we fill in the definition of W, which was eta times the sum, and now we, can, we get this Z times, uh, Z times W, we can replace it by the minimum over all patterns, uh, and so then we get a larger than because this inner product is larger than the minimum. And then we're left with a sum over mu of uh, m mu, which we can, which is definition is m, right? We have defined m here as the sum over mu m mu. So we get we get this this inequality here. <laughs> and so now we can uh, put our definition of d mu star, a d w star. We can put in there by just multiplying by a, a w star. So then this is this is the same. So this is the one side. And the other is we look at the norm, the change in the norm of w in one learning step. So the, the, the change in the norm of W is the norm of W after a learning step minus the norm of W before the learning step. And we can take out this, this double product, so we get W squared minus W squared, that cancels, we get a double product, 2 eta W Z mu, which is this one, and then we get a uh, eta squared W uh, norm W Z mu squared. Right? Now, now here the trick comes. Now, in this learning step, uh, the learning only takes place if the, if the inner product of W and Z is negative, right? So this, thing, this term is negative. So that means that this one is less than this, right? Because we, 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 this is a negative term. So this whole thing is less than just the last term. Now, this last term is a constant, and it's in fact bounded by the norm of the input uh, vector. So if they're all binary, if the Z are just plus or minus one, then it's, the norm is just a vector of uh, length uh, n, and it's just n, the input dimension. So in other words, the change in the w squared grows as, in one step, grows less than this. So the norm of w uh, in, in, uh, in, in m steps, so delta, so delta, w, uh, delta w squared in one step is, is less than uh, eta, uh, eta squared n, so in, in all learning steps, the change is delta W squared is less than eta squared times M times N, because that was the total number of learning steps, right? And so if we start with a norm zero, then the norm of the vector is, is less than the square root of that, so which is uh, eta the square root of M times N. So that's that last result. So now we just divide and we find that uh, the numerator is larger than something and the denominator is smaller than something, so the ratio is larger than this, this ratio and here you find that this is a constant, this is a constant and this one grows with the square root of n. So here you find the proof of the, uh, that, that we need it. And so it's also instructive to see that if you turn this around and you say, okay, let this, let this bound m, let's take m out where it is to satisfy this bound, then you find that m has to be less than, than this and you see that that for problems for which the d w star is very large, those are the easy problems, we find that the, that the, number, of, that the number m is small, and for the problems that are very hard, where the, where the d is close to zero, this number of iterations can be very large. Right? So you see that kind of uh, uh, happening. Okay, so this means that, uh, that you get finite uh, time convergence of the, of the perceptron. Any questions about this, this convergence rule? So, another curious fact about the perceptron is its capacity. So we have, uh, and the capacity is about how many, uh, uh, how many instances can I learn with a with a with a uh, with such a with such a machine with such a perceptron. So the the the, the, the rationale is the following. So I have. Um, um, if I have uh, three points in two dimension, then I can, uh, I can define, uh, these are three uh, vectors x in the input space. How many problems, how many perceptual learning problems can I define on this? Well, this point I can be in two classes, this one can also be in two classes, this one can also be in two classes, right? So if I have p patterns, I have two to the power p different problems that I can define. And I'm asking myself which fraction of that problems are linearly separable, if I would a random, in a random sense, right? And uh, so in this case, what is the fraction 
that is linearly separable? Huh? All, right? Yeah, all. Right, because either we, we have them all of the same class in which we put a separator on the side, or there is one of one class and the other is the two class put it in the middle. Okay, so they're all, all linearly separable. Now I add a fourth point, and now what? So now we have 2 to the p, this is now 16 problems, and some are linearly separable and some are not, right? If I have three of one class and one of the other class is linearly separable, but if I make an exclusive or problem on this, where this is one class and this is the other class, I cannot, uh, cannot separate them, right? So you can, uh, you can count. So if you say, okay, I do random, uh, so what, what, is, what plays a role here is, is p, the number of samples that I have, the number of problems, but also n, that's the input space dimension. So if I would have four problems, I have it in two dimensions, there are some are not linearly separable. We have four, four, prob four samples, maybe in three dimensions, or in four dimensions, or in five dimensions, at some dimension, xd, it becomes linearly separable, it becomes easier, right? So uh, there's, a, there's an interplay between p and n, and uh, this probability of being linearly separable. Now the answer to this question is given here by this formula, which is the cpn, this is the number of linearly separable colorings uh, of p points in n dimensions that can be separated uh, through a plane through, through the origin. In this case, this is assuming through the origin, it's a detail. Um, and so I should maybe explain a little bit. So this, uh, uh, so this, this p over this, uh, this notion of n over k, you know of course what it means. It means uh, n factorial over k uh, factorial n minus k factorial, that's this uh, combinatoric number, but this is usually defined uh, when uh, k is uh, between 0 and uh, less or uh, equal than n, but here it can also have values, this i can have values up to n minus 1, and you can have the case that n is larger than p, and so then by convention uh, it is defined that uh, n over k is zero if uh, k is, is larger than, than n. So that's the convention that is, uh, that is taken there. So if you, um, um, I'm gonna not going to go through the details of the math, but if, you, if, you do, if p is smaller than n, it turns out that this uh, sum is just uh, the complete sum of all the polynomial, uh, all these uh, factorial terms, is equal actually to 2 to the p minus 1. So the whole thing is 2 to the p. So if, if p is less than n, you will find that all problems are linearly uh, all all problems are linearly separable. Now, if p is equal to two n, you will do will fill it in this formula in, and what you will find out that that you get the answer two to the power p minus one. That means if you divide two to the power p minus one divided by two to the p, you find one half. You see that fifty percent is then you just fifty percent is linearly separable, and if you go for p. Uh, larger, uh, or uh, yeah, p larger than 2n, you will find that this, this fraction goes more and more to zero. The picture is like this, here. It's given like this. And um, uh, it is plotted here as a function of p over n. So if p over n is 2, we have this 50-50 uh, hit here. And it's, it there's draw a line for different values of n. So for n is small, this is sort of a smooth curve. And if n gets larger, this curve gets steeper and steeper. And if n goes to infinity, it actually is a step function at, uh, at 2. So if you have your very large problems, like 1,000 inputs in your perceptron, and you have a random instance, then the random instance will have a probability of almost 1 to be linearly separable if your number of samples is less than 2n. And it's also probability 1 that it will not be linearly separable if your number of samples is larger than 2n. Right? So this is, uh, this is the situation. So this is quite curious, and this, this number two is called the capacity of the perceptron. That is the number of samples in a random set that can be, uh, can be satisfied. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So there's also, now this is about random instances, right? So if you, if you take about, um, if you think about some typical instance, or that you will see in a, in a textbook on machine learning, you will have some data here and some data here, right? And you can draw a line here. And, and so here you have the particular case that the data here are all of one class and the data here are all of the other class. That's very different from these random instances here, right? That we have this, so this, this is sort of, so in other, in other words, uh, 
in random data there is no structure, but in, in real data, of course, there is structure. Right? There's a certain probability that if you have a point of a certain class, then there is a, it's likely that the nearby point will also have the same uh, class probability, the same uh, class label. And so, um, so in, in this sense, the, uh, this, this story is actually saying something about, as I just said, about random instances, but it also, it also says something about generalization. And that is that if you, um, the, the fact that it's linearly separable here means that, it, that in a random instance you can, uh, you can put a line in between there. And in fact, you can put many lines in between there. There's a lot of room for different lines to, to put there. Right? So another way to, um, and, and if you're on this side, there is, there in a random instance, there's no line to put there. But if there's structure in the data, then the structure will actually say that, for instance, the data are such that they are generated from an from a unknown teacher that actually is a linear separable perceptron, so there is a solution there, then of course you get a different reasoning, and then this says that on this side of the line, actually you're going to uh, nail down the solution to, to exactly one solution, and uh, so the probability may be zero, but there may be still one solution, and here there's actually too much room, and there is, there's many solutions, and the generalization is bad. Right? So this is also a story about generalization, that if you have few samples, p less than 2n, the, the, freedom, the freedom is massive, and, and so you cannot expect good, good generalization, but if your p is larger than 2n, you will be able to, to pick out that one solution that is actually hidden there in that structure of the data. So that is, that is the second lesson of this, uh, of this picture. Any, anybody confused about that? Okay, so the um, well, the proof is uh, is uh, is maybe also insightful. So the so it, this is our perceptron that go that go through the origin. So these are this is a mathematical detail that in fact so the, the perceptrons cannot be uh, anywhere, but they always go through the origin in this high dimensional space. That's that's for the proof is needed. Um, so suppose um, suppose that we have uh, a number of uh, so. So CPN is the number of linearly separable problems that I have on P samples in N dimensions. Now suppose uh, that I have uh, one of these instances, which is a linear separable instance, which is uh, these four points. There's two uh, of one class and two of another class, and I can draw a line between them. This is one of the instances, one of the colorings in this set, in this total number of colorings, uh, to that is linearly separable. Now if I add, if I add one point uh, to it, I can, uh, I can either put it uh, somewhere here, in which case uh, I can define two new problems, because I can put the point uh, on this side of the line or on that side of the line, right? So I can, uh, or even better to say, I can put a line on this side of the point or on that side of the point, so I can make two colorings. With, with, uh, so if I add one, either I can make two extra colorings, or I put it uh, here, uh, and in which case I can only put one coloring, right? Because I have to put it red in this case if I, if I put it here, right? So you can see that the number of uh, linear separable problems with one point extra is uh, for these problems, the problems of type A, I can make two instances, and for the problems of type B, I can only make one instance, right? So that's, uh, that's what I get. And so since A plus B is CPN, this is also equal to... Uh, CPN plus, uh, plus A, right? I can write this in, the, in this way. And now A is the, is the set of, uh, of, of, of uh, problems where the point uh, can be actually go through the separator, right? That's, that's the set of A. And this, is, this separator also goes through the origin, that was the, 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 the construction here. You can, you can figure it like here, that, that it's going through the origin and it's going through these points, and in fact, it defines a, uh, a separate a problem in one dimension lower, right? Because this one dimension is taken out. So this is actually CP n minus one. So you get this recursive formula here, and this is, has to be solved. And now you can either think very hard, or you can just try and take this trial solution and fill it in and see that it works. And this is uh, this is the proof of, of this uh, of this induction. Okay. Do we take a break, or how does this uh, how does it work? We just go on for uh, up, to you. up to me. Well, it's up to you also, I guess. I mean, I was the only one with the side here. Uh, well.
What is, what is the uh, custom? No break. Custom is no break. OK, so we have no break. Sorry. OK, so. Uh, <laughs> so so this, this perceptron has a, has, a, has a funny learning rule which converses in a, in a finite number of iteration. But most learning rules actually are not of this type. And they are typically of the form that one uh, defines a cost function which is then minimized. And the cost function expresses a desire that we want the output of the network to be close to some target output. Right? And this is what we're going to specify, and then we're going to make that error as small as possible, and that's the optimization problem. For instance, I can have a, a, a network where I have uh, some, uh, where Y is the output of some network, maybe a very deep 20-dimensional, uh, uh, 20 20-layer uh, 20 network. I have some input. I have a bunch of parameters, which are all the parameters in my, in my neural network, and it produces some output Y. And I also know the label of this, of this input, because this is a cat, and so this has the label of cat. And so I want this, this output of the network to be close to the cat label, right? So I want to minimize this distance. So I take the square of that, and I get a positive number, and I want to minimize that. And I want to do that at si simultaneously for all the data that I have, all the samples that I have. So the N labels here, the samples. And so this is a criterion that depends, the data is given. So this is something that depends on W. And I just want to find the W that uh, minimizes this E, right? And this is a typical way uh, to do that. Um, in classification, you could have other uh, criteria. So this is, for, this is typically for regression, where, uh, where the outputs are continuous. If the outputs are, uh, are binary, say 0, 1, uh, a, couple, a typical use is, is the use of the, uh, the, the, this, this, this cost function, which is not a quadratic error, but it's, uh, it's a different error. Um, uh, this is used for... for, for so in the exercise of, uh, of, uh, for today, you're going to be looking, if you want, at, uh, at the gradient descent applied to uh, a simple perceptron that is trained with this cost function here, this regression cost function, where there's two classes, 0 and 1, and you compute the learning rule, and you then execute the learning rule using different tricks that we're <laughs> going to be discussing now. Anyway, there's in both cases, there's some error which has to be minimized, right? So that's the upshot. Um, so the picture looks like this. We have, a, we have an error, which is a function of W, uh, and it has a lowest value because it's a, it's a sum of square terms or it has some other lower bound. So it's bounded from below. This is very important. If it would not be bounded from below, we would go down and down and down and down. We would never converge. We would end up at, uh, in China, and we would not get uh, any convergence, right? Uh, we don't want to go there. Um, so. Uh, so this, this, that is bounded from below is very important because then we can minimize and then uh, something got to give, right? We have to stop at some point. So this is the whole trick of, the, of this uh, gradient descent. So we're going to find, so in one dimension, we, in one dimension we would have a picture uh, like this. Uh, so picture like this, so we have some error function and we want to minimize this. What we're going to find, what we're going to do, is try to find uh, a solution of the set of equations that the gradient of E of W is zero. And if you don't remember the gradient, it's just the E, the, the WI is zero. So this is a set of equations, one for each of the components of your parameters in your model, and you want to set them all zero, right? And so what happens here, there is zero here, the zero here, and the zero here. So you will find a solution by setting this equal to zero, that's either there or there or there, now what happens in these learning rules that actually this one turns out to be unstable, so you'll never go there. So that's uh, easy, you can forget about that. Although in, in deep neural networks there's a lot of plateaus and you may stay there for a long time, so there's another story I'm not going to go into there. But, you know, if things are slightly, uh, slightly okay, then you will end up in one of these solutions, which is a local minimum, right? So uh, this is not the global minimum, but the gradient is zero and it's an attractor, so you may end up there and never get out of there. So, uh, if you do this gradient uh, procedure that we're going to be discussing now, uh, you will end up in one of these, uh, one of these uh, solutions. Right? So it's not a global minimum, it's a local minimum. So if you start here, you will end up here. If you start here, you end up there. And that's... Uh, what if there is a seven point? Huh? What if, if there is a seven point? Yeah. So then you have stability attraction in some directions and you have repulsions in some other, in some other uh, directions. So that's okay. But what, what's the problem is, is if, the, if the gradient gets, gets, uh, gets zero, right? If it gets very, very flat. So then you don't move anymore. In, in, uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a problem, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to minimize it. So the simplest learning rule is called gradient descent, and it is the following. So you say, okay, my, I start with a W here, and now I'm going to compute the gradient, and I'm going to take a step, new W is going to be the old W minus the smallest number times the E dW. And we can put indices, so the index I, like this. So we do this in all directions, it's a vector update, so this whole vector gets updated in the negative gradient direction. So the picture is that you, um, so what you can now show if we say, okay, that we define delta W uh, is uh, minus dE dW, right, then, uh, then we can see that the, that the E in the new point, E plus delta W, we can do a simple Taylor expansion, so we can say this is the E and W, plus delta W, dE dW, right? And now we can uh, fill in the delta W, which is, uh, sorry, minus eta. So we get here this E of W, minus eta, and then this is, of course, a, this is a sum, actually, sum over I, W, I, this. So minus eta, we get sum over I, dE, dW, I, squared, right? Plus higher order terms, right? These are higher order terms I ignore. And it's allowed if the eta is small enough. There is some range of eta for, for which I'm allowed to do this. So I see that this is uh, less or equal than E of W. In other words, my new, uh, my new point has a lower energy than my old point. So I'm going down in this function, in each step, right? And I'm going down with an amount which is the square of the, of the, the norm of the gradient vector, actually. Right? So I keep on going down. If the gradient is big, I go down a lot. If the gradient is small, I go down a little. If the gradient is zero, which is here, I stop because things, not, things don't change anymore. Right? So the fact that, 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 um, that, this goes, that, that you have this property, that it goes down, and you have the property that it's bounded from below, there is a, lowest val there is a lower value uh, that it doesn't go over, means that as I'm talking, To a, to a value. So, and that's the proof of the asymptotic convergence of gradient descent. That asymptotically means after infinite time, you get a smaller and smaller gradient, you get more and closer, closer to, this, to this thing, you get smaller and smaller updates, and, and at some point you, you, you stop. So this is the uh, notion of, uh, of uh, gradient descent. Now, let's, let's look at that gradient descent rule for a very, uh, very simple example. Let's say a quadratic well, right? We have a, so suppose that this E of W is a quadratic form, so this form uh, on the top. So it's a lambda I, W I. So it has curvatures, so we would make a two-dimensional picture. It has uh, curvatures in, uh, in all directions. So for instance here, so it, would, so it would be like ellipsoid, right? It would be like this. So this is, these are, this is W1, W2. And these are lines of constant e, right? So if, uh, if lambda 1, lam so this is e is 1 half lambda 1 w1 squared plus 1 half lambda 2 w2 squared. And if lambda 1 is uh, very small, you get a very shallow well in this direction, and you get a sort of a steep well in that direction. Right? So that's this, this contour set telling you. Now, if you compute uh, the gradient, uh, uh, the, 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 the change in the, in the weight, so it is, uh, it is minus the e to the gradient, so you get this thing. And so the new, the new w is the old w plus the change, so we can write that. So the old w is wi, and the new one is also proportional to wi, so we can take that out of, the, out of the brackets, and so we can write it in this way, right? And so we see that the, uh, that the new w is proportional to the old w with a factor. And this factor, if this factor is smaller than zero, then this solution is attracting itself to zero, which is where the minimum is, right? Which is uh, very easy, right? It's the, the solution is in the, in the origin. So it's attracting to the origin. But the attraction is different in different directions. So suppose that this eta is very small, then uh, this, this number is, uh, is uh, less than one. Um, and, uh, but if, uh, uh, if the lambdas are different, so then in the, in the direction here, where we have uh, lambda, lambda 2 
is larger than lambda 1, right, it's steeper in the, this direction and this direction, you will find that in that direction the, the, the shrinking is more than in the horizontal direction. And you see that illustrated here in this graph. So if you do this learning rule, you start here, you see that in this steep direction you get fast convergence, and in this, in this, uh, this uh, shallow direction, you get slow convergence, right? So the typical line, well, not, you're not going to the origin like that. You go uh, like this in, this in this curving case. Now, if you increase the learning rule, uh, the learning rate, this eta, it actually, this product, this, this term may actually become negative, right? And so then you get the situation that since the lambdas are different, that for one lambda, for one direction, it's still positive, for the other direction, it's negative. For the one that's positive, you get a uniform movement in, in one direction, and for the one that's negative, you get an oscillation, right? It goes to minus, minus, it flips sign. But that's okay, as long as the norm of this thing is less than one, because then it still, over time, shrinks to zero, which is the situation here. Of course, things go out of, uh, out of hand if, the, if this uh, is no longer the true, right? If, if there's one direction for which, uh, for which uh, this norm is uh, positive, then, of course, you get divergence. Okay, so you want to have eta small to get the convergence, but of course you want to have it as large as possible. So this is so you see that the optimization of the eta has to do with the curvature that is different in different directions, and there's actually no easy solution for that to have to set this eta, because different directions would actually like have a different uh, uh, different uh, eta. So how to uh, there's several several ways to deal with that. One way is uh, is called uh, is, is momentum. Now the momentum term is like a, like a massive particle that is moving and uh, the change is, uh, is, is changing the velocity but not directly the position, right? So you have a sort of momentum, it keeps on going before it's actually making the turn, it has a mass. And adding momentum to the, to the learning rule is saying, okay, my gradient, my, my step size is, is the gradient now, or, and a little bit of the old step size that I take, where alpha is a number between zero and one. And so if you put here this, this, this de definition in again, you get here minus eta, that thing, plus alpha, plus minus eta, etc. It keeps on going, 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 right? So you get this whole telescoping uh, thing. And you can see that this, each term is proportional to, uh, to eta, uh, and, uh, and they have increasing powers of alpha. So you get something with eta, and then powers of alpha, and then you get the gradient at previous steps. So here, for k is zero, you get, the, uh, you get, al you get one, and you get the gradient calculated at t, that's this term. And then for k is 1, you get uh, this term. And for k is 2, you get that term, etc. powers of alpha. You get this, this thing, right? So this is the expression that you have for the update. Now, let's consider two extremes. Let's suppose that, um, that the, uh, uh, that, that in, that the, that the, uh, that our learning is such that, um, like here, that the, or like here, that the gradients are always in the same direction. The steps are always in the same direction, like here also, right? Suppose that that's the case. And uh, so, to give you a back-of-the-envelope kind of idea of what happens with this momentum, let's make the very crude approximation that all these gradients are equal, that they're all basically the same. There's a constant, right? Constant gradient. So, we can take this gradient out of here, and then... Um, and then we, we take this, this sum over terms, we take it for t going to infinity, and then we get this, this geometric series which converges to 1 over 1 minus alpha. Right? So we get, this, we get this as a result. So what does that mean? Suppose that alpha is 0 0.9, then you see that, uh, uh, that 1 divided by 1 minus 0 0.9, this gives a factor of 10. So you get in this direction, in this direction where the gradients always have the same sign, you get an acceleration by a factor of 10. Right? So keep that in mind. So that's something that's happening. Now let's look at the other direction where you get this oscillation. So if you have oscillations, then, um, then we can also, we say, let's say we have oscillations, but that each time the gradient in, in absolute value is the same, but it's just changing sign. So we just get then, in fact, a minus alpha here because of this, mind of this sign of this thing. We get a minus alpha here to the power. And we're doing the same reasoning. We get now 1 divided by 1 plus alpha. So if alpha is again 0.9, we get now a, a, a basically a reduction of a factor of two. So you see that this momentum term is acting different in the different dimensions. In the dimensions that where, for which the learning rate is uh, too small and where the gradients are always in the same direction, you get an acceleration. 
And for the, for the directions where the gradient is, where the step size is too large, and where the gradients have alternating sign, you get actually a damping. And that happens at both times. So the net effect is that if you're in this scenario, and you apply the momentum, you get something like this. So you get an, extra, an increase in this direction, and you get a, get a decrease in this direction. So that's why momentum is a very nice, easy way, because it doesn't cost really anything, because you already have computed these gradients. You just have to remember it and add it to the, so it can be a very nice way to accelerate it. Now, something, um, something more uh, profound is, uh, more fundamental maybe, is using a second order method. So, a second order method is, is using the, the following uh, uh, narrative. It says, okay, let's, uh, let's say, okay, we, we have a, um, this cost function, and instead of taking the gradient here, we're going to also compute the Hessian here. And we're going to locally approximate uh, around this point uh, the, the cost function by a, sec by a parabola, by a second order uh, uh, function. So something the picture to keep in mind is something like this. We're going to do something like this. Right? So how does that work? So we can write the E of, uh, uh, so W0 is this point. This is W0. This point is W0. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to approximate it locally by second order Taylor expansion. So we say E in W is E in W0 plus a linear term where B is the gradient plus a second order term where H is the Hessian. Right? So we do second order expansion. And now we're going to, in this approximation, we're going to set the gradient equal to zero. Right? So we're going to look at the gradient equal to zero here. We're going to look for that point. We can do that by setting, taking the gradient, so the gradient of this expression, this is a constant, this is a gradient is zero, this one is linear in, B, in W, it just gives B, and this one is quadratic in W, it gives something linear in W, it gives H times uh, W, right? Where this H and the B are evaluated in the point that we are, W0. So this gradient cannot be put equal to zero, and we can solve for W, right? And we get W is W0 uh, minus this thing, right? So, uh, so this is, uh, so look at this, this is, looks almost like gradient descent, except that we replace uh, eta by h minus 1, right? So instead of having a single number, we have now this uh, whole covariance matrix there. So we have no, not to worry anymore about the step size, because it's given by the Hessian. Um, and, uh, but we have to compute that thing, of course. Now, in, in the gradient, compu computing a gradient is, uh, as we will see in the multilayer perceptrons, is, uh, is something if you have n parameters, uh, computing the gradient can be done in, in, order, uh, in order n, which is, uh, which is quite remarkable, but it can be done by doing the backpropagation uh, rule. But of course, computing the Hessian, that's an object of order n squared, right? And so we have to, we have an order n, so if we have a million parameters, then computing a Hessian is really a, not a, a no-go. And furthermore, we then have to invert that Hessian. That's even, uh, even worse, because that's order n cubed, inverting a, inverting a matrix. So for large problems, this is really uh, a no-go. But what, you can, what, what is quite easy to do is actually to consider di the diagonal as an approximation, which is called uh, pseudo uh, quasi-Newton method. So the diagonal of H, of course, is only n uh, entries. The second order, these are the, the diagonal entries. And the inverse of a diagonal matrix is very easy, because you just invert the diagonal elements one by one. So that goes very easy. So that's very cheap, so that's something you can, uh, that you can do, of course. But you, of course, if the problem is, uh, that works well in these cases, but if this ellipse would be oriented like this, it would, of course, no, not work, because you need the off-diagonal elements of this Hessian then to, to do it well. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, so this second-order method is really a no-go for many uh, machine learning uh, problems. But uh, so let's let's look at something else. So there is something called uh, a line search. So this looks at, at face value looks like an excellent idea. So why don't we do the following? So we are uh, we have this uh, we have this problem where we have uh, basically this uh, sort of contour where we need to optimize. And suppose that we start here and we have computed the gradient, which points more or less this direction. I've you now convinced you it doesn't point here, right? It points uh, this direction. And so I could do a line search. I say, okay, let's, uh, let's go this way and let's do this one-dimensional optimization. I, uh, tell me how far I need to go, right? So if I'm not far enough and here I'm too far, I should go somewhere, uh, somewhere here, right? This is where I then do the first optimization. And then from there, I could do again a gradient, and I do uh, do an optimization. I do again an optimization, right? 
I could do that. Problem with that is already illustrated in this picture. So let's see what happens. So if I take, so I do this, right? So W1 is W0 plus, uh, plus some increment, where the increment is, uh, is in the direction of the, of the gradient, right? And, uh, and so we have now one dimensional optimization. So we have to say, okay, the E in along this line, so W0 is given, D0 is given. I want to optimize lambda zero such that this gets minimized, right? So I want this one dimensional optimization along this line. Right? And if I take the gradient of this, I get, uh, I get, the, the, I get basically uh, the gradient of the argument gives me d0 times the gradient of uh, the function, which is the gradient of the function, right? So I get this, this expression here. Yeah? So how do you decide which direction to start in? The gradient. So you take the gradient. You, take, you compute the gradient here. Because you compute the gradient here. The gradient gives you a direction, right? Okay. So the, the gradient, like in, like, in, like in this problem, here, here, the, here the, uh, the gradient also, you started here, the gradient gives you a direction. Okay, sure. Yeah, so it gives you... Uh, and how do you decide subsequent lines? I'll come to that. So, so, the, so the line... Well, the line search, the direction is given by the gradient in the, in the current point, and the step size, this lambda, is found by minimizing this thing, just looking for where is this thing minimal, right? If you just walk on the line, go down, 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 up, 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 so somewhere it's minimum. You want to find that point. And if you take that, so you get the, the gradient of this expression, which is a W1, uh, got here, times D0. So this is the, by the chain rule, you get this. So in other words, you find a point W1, which is this new point, which is W1 here, so this is W0, this is W1. You find the point W1, which is such that its gradient there is orthogonal to the current search direction. So the gradient in the new point, that's on the, it's, it's staring right at you, the gradient in W1 is orthogonal to D0. D0 is this direction, right? So the gradient is, is orthogonal to that. So it's like walking in the mountains, if you go down some valley and you go in a direction and then suddenly you go up, if you stop at the lowest point, the gradient at that point is orthogonal to your path. Right? It's a profound uh, wisdom of uh, mountaineering. So, okay, so you make, you make so the, the lesson is that you make orthogonal steps and that's bad because now you're going to get this jig jack jig jack jig jack orthogonal step game to the origin and this is really, really bad. So this, this converts very, very poorly. What you would like to do is to go not orthogonal, but, uh, well, you would like to do this, right? I mean, this is uh, the solution. But you would like to go in the, in the, uh, in, in a, a little bit in the direction of the gradient, but also in a little bit in the direction of the old search direction that you went. And that is, uh, and that is the idea of, of uh, conjugate gradient descent. And that's a really good idea, a very powerful idea. So what you say, okay, my new search direction, D1 prime, is, uh, is something uh, with the gradient uh, at that point, which is orthogonal to the, to the previous one, right? That's, uh, this one is, uh, this D1 is orthogonal to the current, uh, to the old, old direction, and a little bit of the, of the old direction. So I'm gonna move in these two directions. I take a little bit of the old direction, and a little bit of the gradient direction. And of course, the whole intelligence is in the size of this beta, how to choose this beta, right? We don't know that. So now we do line optimization, we start again, we go W2, we start here, and we're going to do line optimization in this direction, and, uh, and we're going to find a, a point uh, W2, and uh, that's, that's W1 plus lambda 1 times this D prime uh, thing, so we find some uh, lambda 1 larger than 0, such that, uh, again, we do uh, this optimization, so we find... We're going to find that, uh, so we have E W2 is E W1 plus lambda 1 D1 prime. And so we, we minimize, we do the E W2 D lambda 1 is, uh, is equal to D1 prime inner product uh, gradient E W2. And we want to set this equal to zero. Right? So, so we get this condition here. 
right? Okay, now, now here the trick comes, the, uh, the inside comes. So what we want is the gradient to be zero in all directions, right? Now we had a first point, uh, we had a first point here where this, this, this gradient is a vector, and so this is a whole vector of the whole set of equations you have to solve. So this first thing said the gradient is zero in the direction d0, right? The second point says the gradient is zero in this direction d1 prime. What we're now going to set is that we want this, this new gradient not only to be zero in this direction, but also in the old direction d0. We're going to demand both. So what this, and that will fix us on our beta. So we say zero is this, is this inner product, which we can write by Taylor expansion, that the, the gradient in this point is the gradient in that point plus lambda 1 times the, the increment, which is uh, this uh, increment times the Hessian calculating that point. Right? So we get this expansion. Now D, this one is already zero because that's what we had here. This one was already zero, so we can just call it out. So what we're left with is, and this is a constant, so we can take that out. So we get D H D prime is zero. This is, and this is called the conjugacy relation. So we don't want... So if H is a diagonal matrix, we want our search direction to be orthogonal, but if H is not a diagonal matrix, uh, we want something that satisfies this. And this is, gives a non-orthogonal new search direction, as pictured by this. Now, I still haven't told you how to find this, this beta, and I'm actually not going to tell you in detail because I don't have time, but you can, uh, it's on this sheet, um, you can uh, do uh, expansion of, the, of, this, of this Hessian, and it's, it's stipulated out here, and you can express this beta uh, to lowest order in the Taylor expansion in terms of, uh, of the gradients that you compute, you see, in, in W1 and W0, so things that you already know, so you can compute that. So this is just based on gradients, you can compute this beta, and this beta will then give you which, uh, which direction you have to go. And so uh, it's, not a, it's not an easy algorithm because, uh, so you are in, what is the algorithm? You start in a certain point, you compute the gradient, you do a line search, then uh, you do a minimization, uh, you find the point, then you have to find a new direction. The new direction you have to find as part of the gradient uh, and the old direction for which you have to compute this beta which is uh, okay because you have these, uh, these things all there, but then you have to again do a line search to get to the minimum, etc. So uh, particularly implementing the line search is hard, but it's worthwhile for, uh, for certain problems, particularly when you have uh, high dimensional problems and uh, when, uh, when there is not... Uh, so for, for if you have limited data, so for very large data problems like neural network problems, this is not a good idea. But for uh, data where you have, if you have uh, small problems in, in high dimensions, small data problems in high dimensions, this can be a very, very effective uh, and much better method actually than the, than the uh, uh, momentum method. You can prove that if uh, the problem is quadratic, right, like, like this problem, quadratic problem, then this conjugate gradient method converges exactly in n steps, where n is the number of dimensions. So, uh, so you go one direction, two directions, you're done. And in n dimensions, this happens also. So it's it's provably convergent in uh, in n dimensions. Of course, for nonlinear problems, this is not true. But uh, you know, it gives a little bit of the flavor of uh, why this is a good idea. In fact, quadratic problems are are, are intimately related to solving linear systems of equations. And uh, one of the best methods to solve linear systems of equations is actually using the conjugate gradient method. So that's under the hood in many packages that you uh, may encounter for solving linear, large linear systems. Okay, that's that. So, um, uh, how much time do I have left? 15 minutes? Uh, huh? Who says half an hour? <laughs> the organizer says half an hour. <laughs> and who says 15 min 16 minutes? Okay, okay, well, let's try to make a compromise. Okay, so uh, what you may have all heard of is stochastic gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent is, is at, at face value an extremely stupid idea that you say, okay, instead of, uh, of computing the gradient, I'm going to take only part of the gradient. I'm going to make an approximation of the gradient. And the approximation that I make 
is the following. I say, okay, my, energy, my cost is the sum of terms, one for each, each data point, right? We saw that we had this, uh, this cost term, uh, like here, uh, where were we? Where we? Uh, he, uh, here. So we have, a, we have this quadratic error, the sum of terms, one for each sample, right? And so in general, we can have this, uh, this situation that we have uh, such, a, such a sum of terms. And so why don't we do the following? We just pick random one of these n's, one of these samples, and we compute the gradient in that, for that sample, only one of the terms out of n, and we take a gradient step with that in, in thing. So, so the picture there is the following. So we have the gradient, the full gradient, maybe this, but it's, it's a sum of terms, right? There's a gradient importing all kinds of directions, and the sum of this, all this, is this resultant, right? Because we have E is the sum over N of E N, and therefore the gradient of E is also the sum over N of the gradients of uh, E N. So it's a, it's a sum of, of, of gradients. So instead of moving in the gradient direction, one, for one sample you move in this direction, and then you take another sample which moves you in that direction, so you get some sort of a stochastic motion uh, where the stochasticity is because of the random choice that of the samples that you take, right? And you can do it with single samples, but you can also, people talk about mini-batch, then you take, uh, you have a data set maybe consisting of a million samples, you take mini-batches of size 100 that you draw at random, or you make a fixed partition of the million samples in bins of, of 100 and do it in, in this way. So then you have also a learning rate, which, sorry for the, for the cluster of notation, is I call, uh, call alpha, uh, which is the eta before, and there's a sub t, meaning that it uh, is in principle, it's time dependent. Now, this actually, what we want to, what we want to solve is, is this system of equation. We want to solve gradient E uh, is zero, right? And uh, we know that this is a, is a sum over terms of the gradient of, of E n, each depending on W. So we want to solve this. Now, there is a very old theory, uh, which, is, which is very, very nice to know, which is, um, which is called uh, the Robbins-Monroe Robbins uh, theorem, and it's about stochastic approximation. And it gives actually the, 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 the answer for why, this is a, un, why and under which conditions this is a good idea. So that in general, the, the Robbins-Monroe uh, uh, setting is the following. So instead of W, we have X as our thing that we want to solve. We have MX is A. This is a... Uh, high dimensional or multi dimensional uh, many set of many equations with many variables like like uh, like this here and the setting is is that is m of x is a sum of terms in fact you can think of it as a probability there's some random variable uh, and it, it is made out of a sum of terms so in this case we have also this because we can think of this as uh, as 1 over uh, 1 over n and this is n is 1 to n and so we can write this as a, so we can write this as the sum over some uh, stochastic variable xi, where uh, we can put p, uh, no, we can say, let's, uh, let's uh, say, uh, uh, yeah, so we can basically, no, let's just, so we can just pull this p of, p of xi, we can just say it is 1 over n. It's uniform, uniform probability, uh, we take all the samples with the same probability, and that is uh, our setting that we have here. So this x is a vector, a is a vector, because we have many equations, M uh, is a vector, which is uh, this left-hand side, and N, uh, what's N? N is, uh, is each of these gradients, is also, of course, uh, vectors. Uh, and, uh, right. Uh, so, the Robbins-Monroe algorithm is the following. I start with an initial x0, and I choose random from this probability distribution. Read here, we put random uniformly. We choose uh, one of the patterns, and we update uh, the rule, the x according to the old x plus alpha times, uh, times the difference of the left and right hand side here. Right? We're doing this. And then uh, the statement is, uh, uh, so if, if, this, if this m is a, is a convex, uh, convex problem, then, uh, and x is a the solution, then you can prove that this sequence, x, goes to that unique solution uh, uh, in, uh, as I'm talking, in, the, in the sense that the norm goes to zero, provided that this, this learning rate, this alpha, has these properties. Now, the, the, the first one says that uh, it should stay non-zero, so it's decreasing. And there can, be, uh, there can be two things wrong with decreasing. One is that it decreases too fast, 
then it decreases before actually the, the, the process has converged, right? And this is to ensure that that doesn't happen, so that the sum of terms is sufficiently large. And in fact, it has to add up to infinity. The second is that actually it goes to zero at some rate, because asymptotically you want it to go to zero. So this is uh, because asymptotically you want the, the update to get smaller and smaller so that you get to a, to a fixed uh, solution. So a, a, um, a solution that satisfies both of these is, for instance, alpha is 1 over t. So if you have 1 over t, you sum 1 over t. It's like integrating 1 over t. You get the log, and the, the log evaluated at the, at the end gives the infinite. Yeah? No, 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 no. No, no, so you need to have, uh, so this is for convex problems. So the M has to be a convex. You, you try to find the root of the function M of X equals A, right? Uh, so that's the root finding. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's slightly, so for instance, if you're quadratic well, yeah, then uh, M is the gradient of that, so it's a straight line. So it's convex. So M is the gradient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so so this this uh, is a, is a way that satisfies that. So if we ap apply this to to uh, to our case, so then the, the we get the training error is is uh, this sum of terms. Sorry that I, I keep on changing the notation. So the gradient was this. So the, the uh, romans monroe problem you get if you take that mu is, the, is actually the, the xi and it takes a different uh, values of different samples. The p, the, the probability of that mu is just uh, uniform. We take the a, this, this thing, we take it equal to zero because that is uh, this zero here. And we take, uh, uh, we take uh, uh, n is, uh, sorry, 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 this is, no, this is, this is wrong, this is a gradient. This is one of the gradient terms, of course. So that, in other words, this, this, this romans munro uh, theorem says that the stochastic gradient descent method uh, converges uh, if you choose random patterns and you update it in this way uh, and you take your learning rate uh, to zero. So this is very powerful because, um, uh, in fact, you see in the exercise you will see that uh, actually uh, when this is applied in the case of this uh, logistic regression, that this stochastic gradient ascent gives a very fast, very fast convergence. If you want to know more about that, there's a nice paper by Sol Dijkstein which reviews all these uh, different stochastic gradient ascent. There's, there's a lot more to this, uh, which I don't have time to review. Uh, so, when you say convergence, you mean global? No, these are, these are methods for, for convex problems. So, yeah, yeah. So they, they will find, they, find the, the, they, they do a local optimization. But of course, uh, then there is all kind of heuristics that, if, for instance, if you have a neural network and you have plateaus, adding noise will, will maybe help you to get off the plateaus, and the plateaus are known to be a very uh, serious uh, problem of the of a st stop of, a, of, a, of slow down of the convergence. So this kind of stochasticity has other advantages, just you know, getting off plateaus. It also um, you can also reason that if you have this noise that then you have a multimodal well. That there is that this noise may actually help you to get from uh, from one from one to the other, uh, but of course that is uh, that you need significant amount of noise uh, to do that. So um, yeah, so there may be more reasons that it's a good idea to do stochastic gradient descent, uh, and people have been introducing other kinds of noise into the neural network training, like dropout, uh, etc. And then they say this is the reason why we have such a good deep neural networks, and then now. Last year they said it's uh, no longer true, and so anyway, so there's a lot of uh, uh, things going back and forth. I have uh, not so much time anymore. I could do the, the deep neural net, the multilayer networks. I think I'm not going to do it because I want to stick to the perceptrons. Multilayer networks is, uh, can do uh, many function approximations and uh, is, are universal, so they can fit any function if you just put enough hidden units by it. One of the important things is this backpropagation uh, scheme. Uh, the reason is that if you normally have, if you have a, normally a function which is a function of a whole bunch of parameters, all these parameters, and you would evaluate, so okay, evaluating this function 
will cost you at least linear in the number of parameters, you would think, right? And you'd have to see each parameter at least one, so it's order, this would be uh, evaluating, this would be order n. So if you now have the gradient uh, of E, it would also, uh, for each component of the gradient, it would also be order n. So you would expect that all the gradients would be order n squared, typically, right? That is what you would expect. Now, the, so for neural networks, it may be, this may be a problem because n may be very large and this you don't have the time. Actually, the back propagation, the, the, the nice thing about it is that it's sort of an administrative scheme that allows you to do this computation in order n time. So that's, that's, that's really the, the upshot and the details I'm going to leave for you on the, on the slides to, to work it out. So basically, you have a forward pass in which you compute all the activities, you have a backward pass in which you compute all the errors, and then, then you multiply that, and each of these operations are, are linear in the number of uh, parameters that you have. Okay, that's uh, that, uh, the universal approximators. Yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so, in, so one of the things that is, that is very popular is these convolutional neural networks. Uh, and they work uh, if you have certain uh, certain structure uh, in in your data. And one one very I think a very simple way to understand the, the convolutional neural networks is is by the idea of uh, of weight sharing. So if I suppose that my input space is is one dimensional, uh, and I have here a, a hidden unit, and I and it's looking at uh, these three inputs. Now, if these are pictures, then the statistics that I pick up here is going to be the same as the statistics that I pick up there, etc. It's a translation invariance, right? This cat can be anywhere in the picture. So, if I have a second neuron which looks at, uh, say, these three neurons, these three uh, weights, then I can enforce a weight sharing. That I say, in fact, uh, I'm not going to train these things independently. I'm going to uh, enforce that this weight is equal to that weight, and this weight is equal to that weight, and that weight is equal to that weight, right? So I can do that then, um, and so uh, if I have many, uh, if I have to cover the whole input space, of course I have many neurons to do that, and this will give me uh, what is called a feature map. So it will be the output of all these, uh, of all these neurons that, have the, that do the same feature, the same feature because they all have the same weights. So this is one feature map. And then I'm going to have many feature maps because, of course, I can, also, I can learn one feature of these three input variables, but I can also learn another feature of these three input variables. So then I get a second feature map, right? And that's, that's the weight sharing among all these uh, neurons that encode for the same feature. And that is, in essence, is the, uh, is the convolutional uh, uh, idea. And, uh, yeah, so I'm not going to... But maybe one thing is important to note, that these ideas are extremely old. These, uh, so these are papers from the 80s and, uh, and 90s that already have these ideas uh, in there. Uh, so then, of course, there was the uh, world-famous ImageNet uh, competition in 2012, where this is a computer vision uh, competition where they have a data set where there's a benchmark with 1,000 classes, 1.2 million training samples, 50,000 validation images, and 150,000 test images. And uh, this was sort of the state of the art, so the, 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 to get the, the, the error in getting the top uh, correct used to be in this, this order uh, 45, 47 percent uh, error to get the top correct. And then suddenly these convolutional neural networks came uh, around and they, get, they cut an almost 10 percent of that uh, error down. So that was the big, uh, big hype that, uh, that, that started a lot of this, uh, this interest in deep, uh, in deep learning. And I think uh, it is, you know, it's just absolutely amazing, and it is of, of course true that uh, given enough data and given enough, uh, particularly enough data, and also given enough uh, computers, uh, you can uh, do amazing things. These uh, things do. Of course, there's always a certain uh, worry about a certain brittleness, right? That uh, that you get a solution that is uh, sort of over-specialized on a particular data set. And it may not uh, may not so well generalize to uh, to other settings. So there is there's it's these these solutions are very complex, and, and in a sense somewhat what brittle, and there is uh, some some papers out there, uh, particularly Joel Pinot was 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 talking about that. You may want to look at some of those papers uh, about some critique on the on the robustness of these solutions. Uh, this is one of my famous favorite examples here. So this is a uh, this is one of these test set images, which is then the, the deep network is then also connected to uh, 
um, to a language generation uh, recurrent neural network. And so this is an image that this machine has never seen before. And so you present it and it outputs a group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables on, on the fruit stand. I think this is absolutely amazing. I mean, if I would have, sh have seen this example 15 years ago, I would not have believed this, that this could be done no, on, on, on a new image. So I think it's, it's very spectacular. And this is showing how uh, the network has attention. So these, these white blobs are actually the attention where the, the text is telling something about where the, where the blob is. It's about the dog and the, the stop sign and the, the giraffe and etc. Anyway, so here you see some papers on the on the deep learning. So this is this old work of uh, Fukushima and Jan Lacan, ImageNet paper, uh, and this is a nice review on uh, deep learning in 2015, where you find uh, many uh, good ideas. So the last part I wanted to do is to connect a little bit uh, all this what I told you to my to my own research uh, and. So this is more a bit of a, a sort of a research talk. And this is um, motivated by the fact that synapses uh, in the neural networks are, uh, are unreliable. So here you see, for instance, uh, firing. This is input. This is, two, this is activity of, of uh, input neuron that is stimulating uh, this output uh, cell. And the output cell is, is recorded at the, what is called the... Uh, postsynaptic potentials, this is not the spiking of the cell, but this is just the effect in the membrane potential of the impinging uh, input spike. And you see that if you put as an input this spike train, then the output in repeated trials is very, very different. Right? You see that very unreliable. You get. So the first response, which is the most important one, you see it's in some cases even completely absent. Uh, and so that, that means that, the, um, that this synapse is a sort of a stochastic variable that is uh, on off and has a certain probability and is not uh, for sure. And so having a neural network with continuous weights which have infinite precision may be not a good model and maybe we have to look at for much simpler uh, ideas. And also for hardware, I may, there's, a, there's a whole other story that is about energy consumption of computation. Uh, did you know that uh, our planet is uh, spending 5% of its energy on uh, computation uh, at the moment and that this number is rising with about 7% uh, per year. They say that the uh, self-driving car, which is going to be in China driving on highways in uh, 2020, by the way, one and a half year, we can just uh, almost uh, look for it. A uh, self-driving car that it will spend more energy on its uh, IT and its uh, neural networks than on its uh, propagation on this movement. So there's a big uh, energy problem there. So having, having cheap hardware, for instance, having cheap synapses, which are just bits, may be a good idea. So uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you do the perceptron uh, problem, so we have again the perceptron, and we now look, we have here weights, W, and uh, we now ask ourselves, what, uh, what is the solution? We have now to find a solution of binary weights for this learning problem, right? And, and you can imagine that this is much harder than the continuous problem. The continuous problem was actually was a, was a relatively easy problem. Uh, if you put it in terms of a, of a logistic regression cost function, as you'll see in the exercise, it's actually a convex problem, has a unique solution in the continuous thing. But if the, if the weights are binary, uh, 0, 1, say, or plus or minus 1, 0, plus or minus 1, then it becomes a, actually an NP-hard problem. So it becomes an intractable problem that's where the solution is expected to scale exponentially with the problem size. So what, what are you going to do? So the energy landscape is going to look a little bit like, uh, like this here, this gray. And um, now it, there's, been, uh, there's been work in the group of, uh, of uh, Ricardo Zecchina and uh, Carlo Baldassi uh, that have, have been looking at, uh, have, have found out that there is different types of minima in, that, in this energy landscape. There are isolated minima, which are these, that are defined by the fact that you have a solution, uh, which is where if you, if you change one bit, it's no longer a solution. So it's, it's an isolated solution. And you have also non-isolated uh, solutions, which is this, which is this area of low values. And so you want to actually uh, have learning rules that, uh, that's, that get you to that, to that kind of a, of a solution. And so this is what we, uh, what we developed, and I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about, uh, about that. So here, this is so-called stochastic binary perceptron. So we have an uh, input x, which were for easy, we take just a binary vector. So these are the inputs. 
then we have an output which is plus or minus one, and we have synapses, which you denote here by S, which are also plus or minus one. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our uh, learning machine. And so we now, uh, we're going to take for simplicity, take the threshold equal to zero, uh, just not to clutter the notation. And the probability of the output given the input is now the sum of all the values of S, or the probability of the output given S and the input times the probability of S, right? So this is, uh, this is just base, uh, base calculus, right? So we do this. So this probability of the output given as an input, this is a perceptron, right? This is giving a, sort of a perceptron. We can model it by this sigmoid uh, function, where sigmoid is basically uh, it's like, like a hyperbolic tangent, something like, something like this, like this kind of a shape. So we have a sigmoid, and we have an argument. So, we have, uh, so we, we're going to have sigmoid beta y times h, where h is the sum over i of, of si uh, xi. And so the idea is that if, um, so if, so if the probability that y is 1 given the input, um, so if we have this sigmoid, right, if we have the probability, if this were our model, the probability of y1 given h is, uh, is the sigmoid of beta h, Right? And this is, that is this curve, where we, here we have h, so the probability is in one class is, uh, increases with h. And beta is a steepness parameter. If beta is large, you get something that looks like this. If beta is small, you get something more, more smooth. So that is the probability of the output 1 given h. And the probability of the output y is minus 1 given h is by this formula is sigmoid of minus beta h. And it's easy to show that that is equal to 1 minus the sigmoid of, of beta h because of the property of this sigmoid uh, function that's on the, sli on the slides there. And so this is, this is correct because this is then 1 minus the probability of y is 1 given h, right? So this is, the, this is then, say, the probability of y is minus 1 plus the probability of y is 1 is equal to 1, right? So this is how this is encoded. That's for a given h. But now this h here is, is made up, this h here is made up of these, uh, of these binary synapses. And, uh, and they have a probability, so they, uh, their probability is given as independent, so for one for each, uh, for each uh, synapse, so these synapses here, which are called S here, these synapses S, we assume that they're independent, uh, and they have a certain rate, and the rate is given by, by W, right? So this is sigmoid, the, the probability of, uh, so here we get again that the probability that SI is 1, is the sigmoid of W, and the probability that Si is minus 1 is the sigmoid of minus W, and so these probabilities also add up, uh, add up nicely to 1. Uh, and so, uh, so the expected value of the synapse is, uh, can be easily shown as the hyperbolic tangent of the, of the W value, and we call this the, the mean, uh, the M. And we can also look at the variance of the, this uh, synaptic value, it's 1, because it's, uh, it's uh, expectation of uh, S squared, which is 1, minus uh, the, the squared expectation, which is Mj squared. So that's, uh, that's the variance. Okay. So this, this synapse is, uh, has a mean which can be between uh, minus 1 and 1. And if it's close to 0, it's very, it has a large variance. And if it's close to one of the ends, the variance is very small. Right? And then we have n of these synapses, and they work together in this, in this, in this network. Uh, this is sort of, uh, the neural model is very similar to the Boltzmann machine, uh, but the, neural, the, the Boltzmann machine is recurrent, and this is a feedforward structure. So in, in the Boltzmann machine, the, the connections go both ways. Right? So the neuron 1 affects neuron 2, and neuron 2 affects neuron 1. Here there's only one, uh, one directional uh, information. So, yeah. So, uh, so H is this uh, total input uh, activity coming in this neuron, and these S are independent. So we can see that if that is H, actually, if we get a sum of uh, stochastic variables, so for given input, this, this thing has a mean value, and it has a variance, right? Which is uh, the sum of all the variances of the... Uh, and since, since Xi squared is 1, that we have assumed here, Xi is uh, plus or minus 1, we get the variance of this H. So H... So the point here to make, let me, let me write it here. So we have this, this, this neuron, which is a sum of, 
uh, this input-output relation, which, is a, which is, has to sum over all this stochastic activity of the synapses, um, the stochastic activity only arises in the output of the neuron through uh, this summed activity. And this summed activity, you can use the law of large numbers, so it has a sort of a mean and it has a variance, and that's all you need to know, and it becomes Gaussian because of... Uh, because all these components are independent. So this becomes Gaussianly distributed. That means that this sum over, over S, which is the sum of all the 2 to the nth uh, possible uh, synapse configuration, can now be replaced by an integral over a Gaussian variable. And so this we can do. And so, uh, so here you see that. So, then, so this Py given x, which was this sum over S of the, the probability of S, which is, which is this term, times the, uh, pro the, 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 the input the, the, the input output relation of, uh, of, a, of a perceptron with given values of the s's. And now sum over all s, this sum over s can be replaced by an integral over h, where we get a Gaussian variable in h, which has a mean and a variance given by this, and this, this function that is now the same. And so we can forget about the whole s dependence, because we only have to integrate over h, which is a one-dimensional variable, continuous variable. And we can do this integral, in the limit uh, when beta goes to infinity, when this, this step size gets, e gets very sharp, and then the outcome is that uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes again a sigmoid uh, with, a certain, with, a, with a different sigmoid. So it becomes a sigmoid which depends on, uh, so, there is the, so if you compare it with this perceptron we here, we have the y and a local field. Here we get also a y and a local field, where the local field is now the mean uh, local field, that's this one. But most interesting, it gets a denominator, which is sort of setting the slope of this sigmoid, which is a uh, uh, sum over the mean activities. So it gets a very funny uh, kind of uh, slope. The slope becomes uh, depending on, on the learning. And so, uh, and, and this, this is, has very interesting properties, as we will see in a moment. So, uh, if we have a data set now for training samples, input-output pairs, we can maximize the, the log likelihood. So that is uh, one of the cost criteria, and that's like, this, uh, like the energies, the cost, the ease that I had before that we were minimizing. We can maximize this quantity. And the log likelihood says, essentially, um, um, uh, it says essentially the following. So for instance, I always give the example of a Gaussian distribution. Suppose if I have some data points and I want to, fit, want to do a maximum likelihood estimate for a Gaussian distribution, I want the best Gaussian, right? And I can have various Gaussian, I put a Gaussian here, I can put a Gaussian here, I can put a Gaussian here, whatever, and all put a Gaussian. What do I have the best Gaussian? What is the best Gaussian? Now I'm going to look for each data point for the probability that I, that, that particular Gaussian has, right? And so here I have get these, Gauss, these values, uh, etc. And I can have these, and I want to maximize it. And what I maximize is the product of that. So I take the, I have for each, uh, I have a Gaussian model, and I have a data mu, and I have parameters uh, theta, say, and I, um, I have a bunch of data, and I'm going to take the product over all these values, and this becomes a function of theta, and now I want to find the theta that maximizes that thing, right? And now I take the log, because that doesn't matter, and then the, the, we get the log likelihood, and then we get the sum of terms. And that's, that's, that's the argument that you use here. Now, instead of having a model just as a Gaussian, we have now a model which is a conditional model that for each input, we want to maximize the, the, the correct output. So we get here an input-output relation. That's the only difference here, but the, for the rest, the argument is the same. And so you get this is the maximum likelihood idea. And so we plug in this, this thing here, we get uh, this, and we do the, we do the gradient computation, and, and, and we can do that. It's not so insightful to look at that gradient. Uh, well, it's here, it's here, but uh, so it has a first term, which is, looks like an input, like a, like a Hebbian tool, which we saw also in the perceptron, right? Multiplying the input and the output activity, this we also had in the perceptron. It has a, this term, it says, well, don't do anything if it's already learned correctly, right? That's a, that is the term we had also in the perceptron. But it has this new term, which has all kind of funny, uh, funny behavior, and we're going to look at this uh, here. So this is some results that we, we get. So we, we take a, a, a binary uh, problem with uh, input, and, and, and output, and we, we're gonna, gonna learn it, and we're, gonna, and we're gonna see what the learning does, so the error gets, uh, gets smaller and smaller. And Q, which is the sum over, Q is the sum over I, mi squared, which is the, 
uh, how much these, these synapses are going to specialize to their value plus or minus one. It's the mean value of each synapse, mi is the value, mean value of each synapse. So if this goes, if mi goes uh, to one, so we normalize one over, the, over n, the number of uh, values we have. So if this goes to one, it means that each synapse has decided whether it has to be plus one or minus one, right? And here you see uh, this q going over time, so it decides for each synapse uh, where it's to go. And so you can do this learning. Uh, this is the case for in which you have. Oh, I should tell you that uh, we had we had the capacity of uh, capacity of the perceptron was two uh, n, right? For the for the continuous weight we have seen it uh, in the beginning of the lecture. Now for the binary perceptron, actually the capacity is uh, zero point eighty three n. So. That's a, that's a difficult statistical physics calculation that, that uh, people have done uh, many years ago. Uh, and, but the good news is it's basically only a factor of two. So it's actually very limited. So you, you give up, uh, you, you reduce full continuous uh, precision to just bits, and you only lose, lose a factor of two in, uh, in capacity. So that's actually quite, quite good. So, uh, of course, learning gets harder if you get closer to this capacity limit. And that's what's shown here on the right. So here, alpha is the capacity, so it is uh, on this scale uh, of the 0 0.83 somewhere here. Um, and you see that the performance of this network for different network size, 10,000 inputs, uh, 1,000 inputs, you get these different lines. And you see that basically you get uh, good learning with this stochastic perceptron rule up to uh, alpha is about 0 0.64, that range. And actually that is, that is pretty good for such a simple uh, algorithm because the, the state of the art is, is in this range uh, using uh, uh, more sophisticated techniques like, uh, like belief propagation uh, methods. Um, so because it's a very, as I said, you know, it's an NP-hard problem if, in essence to, to solve this problem exactly. So this, is, uh, this stochastic rule is promising because it, uh, it, it works well, it's very easy, and it's also possible to extend it to multilayer structures. So, for instance, we have applied it to the to the MNIST uh, data, uh, where you uh, have uh, uh, with three layers, we can use this learning rule and get uh, an error of about 1.7 percent, which is not you know it's not a world record, but the fact that we don't use any convolutional layers, it's also not uh, it's actually quite promising that we get this uh, this result. So that connects a little bit um, what I told you about all these basics to the current research that I'm doing and this paper you can find online. If you have more questions, let me know. Yeah.